First Rand's half-year profit uh, leaped 41% as the pandemic waned. Meanwhile, its retail banking unit, FNB, saw a 32% rise in normalized profit. While the bank experienced muted growth in advances, its deposit growth remained robust thanks to continued growth in its retail and commercial customer base. For more, we're joined by Jacques Salias, who's the CEO of FNB. Jacques, thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's take a review uh, in terms of the six months that was uh, for FNB. FNB, how would you characterize that? Thank you for having me and, uh, and welcome to the listeners and viewers. Uh, I guess the storyline for the last six months is a, a, is a consequence of our two or three year journey as we've had to transition with the COVID and the pandemic impact on our customers and, and unbelievably delighted to have been able to present, uh, you know, incredibly respectable numbers. You know, our retail franchise up uh, close to 40 percent, our, re- our consumer uh, commercial cl- franchise up 20 percent, rest of Africa up over 60 percent. Uh, so it's really been a good outcome of, uh, of our adjustments to, to deal with the pandemic as we help our customers get through through all the impacts, you know, and on top of that also riots that, that uh, some customers had to deal with. So really delighted that the activity in our franchise has been so strong and our customers have been able to get them through the the, the, the impacts that they experienced and uh, and we're able to present these six months results and also they point you know quite quite optimistically to our, uh, our next six months as we've got good momentum into credit growth transactional volumes and activity in the markets we play in so it's a, it's all by, by all accounts a very good six months for us you mentioned in your results that uh, you've increased uh, customer numbers by three percent and i'm curious what kind of customers uh, is fnb um acquiring so a very good, very good point. I mean, the last uh, two years has been a big focus on our existing clients. And uh, clearly we had to transition all our existing customers through COVID, restructure their, help them restructure their financial affairs, keep their businesses going, keep the doors open as much as we could. And, uh, and that's, that's built up a lot of momentum into our existing franchise. And now the growth opportunity for us in both the very big focus in the middle market uh, retail where the market would have seen our competitively our, uh, our value propositions around the middle market, which we refer to as our, our Aspire value props and on our credit appetite in the market uh, supporting clients. So that middle market consumer uh, segments are, are critical for us. And in the, in the startup and, uh, and smaller SME spaces, we think that there is additionally a big focus for us that we, we, we're targeting and, and price points for us, you know, from entry level zero fee products right up into the most complex uh, solutions that people need. So it's a very deliberate strategy at originating the, the middle markets in both retail and, and commercial markets. What's your sense of, uh, I suppose, the appetite for credit? And what does that mean for you in terms from a retail uh, credit growth point of view? Yeah, so fortunately, the economy certainly is looking towards a, a cyclical uptick in credit demand as people are starting to get back into the swing Fortunately, our customers are off to a good start, good momentum. The six months you would see we've had some healthy growth, especially in the, in the retail residential world, as well as in some elements of our personal loan businesses. So that's, that's quite uh, promising. In the commercial market, it's going from strength to strength. So there's, it has been a very, very uh, strong momentum in, in credit in the commercial market. We still have some work to do in, in some of our credit card portfolio and the vehicle finance portfolio to get our competitive uh, value propositions right, the pricing points right. But by and large, uh, you know, sort of where we are positioned for the better risk customers, we've got uh, a very good, very good structure for that. And then we're starting to work hard on, uh, on making sure that we have uh, solutions for lesser credit worthy customers. And clearly those, but we don't have all of the data points, lots of innovation going into that, um, especially new relationships where customers come across, but we don't necessarily have a long relationship with them is how do we originate and help them set up. So a good positive approach to credit this year. Uh, the cycle is going to help us. And then on top of that, we think that the, the macro stuff and, the, and, and, and that's coming at us with structural change that the uh, government's hopefully helping this lead on is going to be a medium-term boost for, uh, for further growth. So we need both the cycle and the structural reforms to come in play. When you look at the insurance business, I mean, what's your sense of how it's performing right now? And I suppose, what does the next six months um, hold for you guys? I mean, insurance is an extremely exciting story for us. Five years ago, we started building out our insurance value props. We started with a life business. 
And we now have uh, recently launched even our home insurance and car insurance on the short term side. So we now have a, a really fully fledged insurance value proposition across our segments. Uh, not all of them at the same level of maturity and penetration yet, but by and large a big success story so far in the setup. And the starting to penetration levels, we starting to reach that uh, that real uh, significant milestones of you know if you want to start getting past a ten or fifteen or twenty percent penetration in your client base, it really is very meaningful. So on by all accounts, a good story, good momentum building up. And the value props are built in two parts. One is obviously we have to be good at the, the, the product offering, but the other part is in insurance specifically, as you know, we're trying to innovate, innovate a lot of the experiences, you know, uh, like we have had in banking for years where we made it easier to do this and easier to do that. You know, the insurance world is, is, uh, is known for its clumsiness in its execution. And we're hoping that we are innovations, you know, simple things like, you know, opening up, you know, getting a life policy, but then claiming for it. Or, or getting insurance, you know, on your car, but then claiming for it. And those on our digital platforms not only are very exciting differentiators from a value prop perspective, but also come in at an incredibly efficient rate. So we can do we can do our offerings much cheaper than what the competitors can do. Let's talk about that digital space. I'm curious to uh, know the kind of uh, capital expenditure you're seeing when it comes to uh, investing in those innovative products and um, trying to get uh, your customers more on the digital side. Yeah, it's an unbelievable story. Um, you know, if you look at our client base, uh, we reported some, some, somewhere around 800 million transactions for the period, uh, I guess, uh, logging to our platform rather. Um, you know, and the privilege of having someone log into your platform just allows you so much opportunity to not only um, satisfy the need they came to you for, like, can I see a balance or can I make a payment? but more importantly to do value adding features and services to those inter interactions. And so, so we're working hard to make sure that we maximize the opportunity to support our clients. You know, ultimately we're all vulnerable. We all have challenges with our finances, whether you're in your personal capacity or your business capacity. And, and those interactions are just so powerful, especially if we know you well yeah. and we've got enough insight that we can actually offer you the appropriate service solution as opposed to the traditional right. old ways of banking of just uh, selling your product. So a big set of investments, Great. not only in our profile, but also the products around it. Jacques, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time. Would have loved to speak to you for even longer, but thank you so much for uh, making time to chat to us. That is uh, Jacques Silias, who is the CEO of FNB, taking us through the uh, six months that was for the bank.